every so often someone says to me in a rather annoyed voice, can't you see what's before you? Well, yes and no. I can see the people, chairs, papers and books that are before me, and also the colors, shapes and patterns that are before me. But do I see the molecules, electrons, infrared light, and so on that is before me? And do I see the United States, or the universe? I see only parts of these comprehensive entities indeed, but then I also see only parts of people, books, etc. And if I see a book, and it is a mess of molecules, then don't I see a mess of molecules? On the other hand, can I see a mess of molecules without seeing any one of them? And if I cannot see a mass of molecules, because mass of molecules, or mass of molecules, it's a better term, uh, is a sophisticated, difficult to discover way of describing what I see, then can I ever say that I see a magnet or a poisonous mushroom? Suppose someone asks if I saw the football coach at my lecture. And I say, no. But he was there in the audience, and I surely saw everyone in the audience. Although I saw him, I say I didn't see him, because I didn't know that the man in the, the left end of the eighth row was the football coach. Well, here we're clearly enmeshed in an all too familiar and often disheartening tangle of philosophical problems. You will be glad to hear me say, and I'm even gladder to hear myself saying, that I shall not be dealing with those problems. <laughs> Rather, the questions concerning me now have to do with the seeing with cases where I clearly see what's not before me. So that's what I have to talk about today. First, though, a word concerning the relation of this lecture to the first. Then we talked about a fairly general problem in the philosophy of art. Today I'm going to be talking about some very specific work in psychology and psychological theory. And this lecture does not depend on, or in any way directly relate to the first. The relation of both lectures to the succeeding ones uh, will begin to appear toward the end of the lecture today. But this does not require any uh, knowledge of the first lecture or any philosophical background and should be understandable to anyone, even psychologists, <laughs> without preparation. That we often, and with considerable regularity and predictability, see what is not there, has been amply illustrated by a host of optical illusions in psychological and popular literature, as well as by magicians and proofreaders. <laughs> what I want to examine now in some detail because it presents some intriguing, even startling, theoretical problems, is the material developed in the study, a recent material developed in the study of apparent motion, of motion seen but not there. And the work that I'm going to talk about is, uh, at least in the first part of the lecture, is reported in a book by Paul A. Kohler's K-O-L-E-R-S. I'm giving you this reference. It's not a very easy book to obtain, uh, and not very well known. Uh, Paul A. Kohler's Aspects of Motion Perception, published by Pergamon Press uh, in 1972. 
works like this. Now, you might ask, why am I going to spend one of these lectures, or a good part of it, summarizing somebody else's book? Well, at first, there are several reasons. First, it presents some interesting and relevant material to the topics I want to talk about. In the second place, it's not very widely known and not very easy to obtain. And in the third place, uh, it is not entirely, it was not carried out entirely independently of me. Cole has been a close associate of mine on Project Zero, and the course of the investigation here uh, often took certain turns as a result of conversations which I had with him and problems I suggested. And in the fourth place, I'm not going to merely summarize what's here, but uh, make some additional observations on it. The simplest and long familiar phenomenon occurs when a spot against a contrasting background is exposed very briefly, followed after an interval of from 10 to 45 milliseconds by a like spot exposed a short distance away. You're sitting in a room looking at a screen, a dot flashes here, another one flashes there, a few seconds later, with just a short distance between them. Now, if the time interval is shorter than that, at the same distance, what we do is just see two simultaneous spots. If longer, we see two separate successive flashes, one after the other. But within the specified time interval, what we see is one spot moving from the first position to the second. You see it appear here and go across here. According to Kohler's, this phenomenon was, quotes, a well-known laboratory curiosity, close quotes, when Sigmund Exner first subjected it to formal experiment in 1875, but until 1910 it awaited more systematic investigation by Max Wertheimer. Kohler speculates that the delay was in part due to lack of suitable apparatus, but even more to the resistance of, quotes in Kohler's work, a mechanistic philosophy that argued for a one-to-one -one correspondence between physical stimulation and psychological experience. The phenomenon of apparent motion is a characteristic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, phenomenon is of apparent motion is a dramatic violation of that correspondence. Close quotes. This is Kohler's explanation of why this phenomenon went uninvestigated for so long. Nowadays, of course, this most commonplace case of apparent motion raises no eyebrows. We tend to dismiss it as due to some expected sort of neural arc jumping, of retinal or cortical short-circuiting. Actually, though, it raises some significant questions. In the first place, is the perception of real motion, that is where a dot actually does move across through the same path, very much like the perception of apparent motion? That is, do we simply pick up the spot at various points along its actual path and then fill in the rest, as we do uh, when the spot traverses the path? Do we do this uh, as we read, for example? and pick up here and there and fill in. In the second place, is the case of apparent motion, in the case of apparent motion, how can the connecting path be built already to the second flash before it occurs? This is a rather surprising thing, isn't it? The dot flashes here, it flashes later here. What we see is one dot moving from here to here, but 
but uh, how, how does it happen that do we know uh, that our perceptual system knew the direction to move the start in before the second one occurred? If we assume that the apparent motion occurs between the perception of the two flashes, how do we know in what direction the spot should move? An intriguing suggestion made by Van der Waals and Ruloffs is that the construction of the intervening path is retrospective. Built only after the second flash occurred, but projected back to the earlier time. This uh, seems to be an intriguing suggestion. Kohler's, by the way, rejects it, and I'll discuss this later. Seems to be an intriguing suggestion because it seems to me the natural suggestion uh, to consider in another context, and that's the context of uh, Professor Dunnett uh, gave a paper recently that I heard on the question, how does it happen that uh, you sometimes dream a dream leading up to a loud noise, which, uh, and you wake up, find somebody knocking on the door. Uh, in other words, you, did you predict what was going to happen or what? And of course, one possible hypothesis is that uh, you delayed reception of the noise uh, for the fraction of time necessary to construct a dream that uh, led up to this occurrence. Carlos rejects both the analogy with real motion perception and retrospective construction for reasons I shall discuss later. Although in neither case is the evidence altogether conclusive, and neither hypothesis is so implausible and unappealing as to be dropped without awaiting the outcome of some further crucial experiments now underway. However, we shall see that the experiments have thoroughly discredited any explanation of apparent motion in terms of any sort of short-circuiting. Kohler's began his experimental investigation by asking what would happen if figures rather than dots or spots were flashed successively. Well, one might expect that if a square or a triangle were used for both flashes, the figure would be seen to move just as a dot would. For a figure is in a sense, it consists of dots. And you could just suppose that instead of one dot moving, all the dots comprising this figure are all the past moved. There's nothing very surprising about that, and that indeed happens. But what if different figures were used of other two flashes? Say, in the first a square, in the second a triangle, or a circle. Well, suppose the figures were of the same shape but different in size. Well, small differences might be expected to be bridged smoothly. But how great a difference would be required to disrupt that smooth transition and yield events apparently as well as actually separate? That is, how different do these two figures have to be so that instead of smooth transition from one to the other, you just get two occurrences? What if the first flash is a small circle and the second is a cube? Well, now, at this point, uh, a theoretical question interested me greatly, and I discussed it with Kohler's. An intriguing possibility is that you might obtain at least one significant measurement for one important kind of similarity of figures this way. If the question is phrased as I put it a moment ago, if we assume that we already have relevant measure of, relevant measure of similarity of figures, and in terms of it, 
we are trying to find out the level of dissimilarity that would disrupt uh, the construction of apparent motion. Uh, that's one way of looking at it, but the trouble with that is that we don't have any such measure of similarity of figures. We perhaps do for size. If you have the same shape, all right, increasing size uh, makes increasing difference. But what about similarity of shapes? Do we have an antecedent measure, either intuitive or any other kind that uh, we can make any sense of, for rating, for instance, the following for similarity? You can think up any number of principles that would uh, arrange these in one way or another. And that's just the trouble, that you can think up any number of them and no one seems to have any uh, clear preference over the others. So why not reverse the whole thing and say, all right, we're not starting with any antecedent idea as to what similarity is but we're going to make an empirical investigation of what similarity of a certain kind is, at least, by saying that uh, the figures such that when they are used you get quick, smooth, good transition. These are more similar than figures uh, where that transition is more difficult, less frequent, occurs over less, uh, requires nearer distance, shorter times, or breaks down completely. That was a nice idea. Uh, the trouble is, uh, it didn't work. The hope was we could arrive at a measure, or at least a gross comparative standard, for psychological similarity of an important kind. Now even before describing to you some details of the experimental results, let me say that the hope was completely blasted by the fact that it turned out to be almost impossible to find figures so different that smooth transition was not achieved. The perceptual system is clever enough to defeat almost every effort to find figures that are so different that it won't, one way or another, transform the first into the second. Now I should point out parenthetically here that the term apparent motion is far too narrow for the scope of the investigation. More generally, the subject is apparent change, which may be change in position, that is motion, or change in shape, or size, or both, or all three. In some of Kohler's experiments, the successive flashes are superimposed. They're not uh, flashed at distances, but one in the same region as the other, but differing in size or shape. So, in these cases, the apparent change involves may involve growth or diminution or deformation, or all of these, without any motion of the whole. So we're dealing with something much more, even though Kohler's book is called Aspects of Motion Perception, we're dealing with something much more inclusive than that. Since Kohler's uses outline figures most of the time, change of shape may often be said to involve motion of the parts, even where you have a triangle superimposed over a square or something of that sort, you could say, well, uh, there's motion of the points on the triangle to the points on the square. Uh, but this needn't be true for growth or diminution. Uh, there are cases where you clearly 
have supplementary material has to be built in, where, where the, it's a matter of addition or subtraction and not of motion. And presently, we shall see reasons why even apparent change is not general enough. We're dealing with something more general than that. And we'll need some such notion, which I'll sometimes use here, the term perceptual bridging. Now let's look at some of the specific experimental results. As, as far as the technical details go, the actual measurements, the nature of the apparatus and so on, I'm not going to try to cover that. I, I've given you the reference if you're interested. All right, in the first case, simple chains of shape without, with, with motion or without, in cases such as I've mentioned, change in particular between outlined plane figures. Here, as I mentioned, uh, there seem to be virtually no limitations. And if you keep your time and distance proper, uh, no limitations on the cases where you'll get smooth transition. Second, change of size without shape change or motion. You have a spot, and then a bigger spot with an interval between, and you see the spot growing into the big one, or conversely, diminishing. And here, the bridging involves the supplying additional material in here, not just supplying the material that constitutes a, a motion bridging. There's no motion here. Third case, Cole has tried using uh, three-dimensional diagrams, cubes and so on, and using a two-dimensional figure for the first flash or the second, using a three-dimensional for the other. What happens here? Still okay. There is smooth transition again, uh, and uh, call it some discussion of the different ways that this takes place. Sometimes, for example, if you're going from a square to a cube, or let's say a cube to a square, uh, it can be seem to be a kind of compression. In other cases, a kind of extraction of the say, the front square from the figure. But in any case, very little difficulty in getting the kind of note. Well, these cases, I think, already are enough to discredit any short-circuiting theory. But we will see there are even more surprising cases and those which are discredited even further. On page 82 of his book, Carlos produces this fascinating case. Can you all see that? That's the first display that he puts on. It has all four of those. Now, the second display, and I'll have to indicate it this way, this comes on, the whole thing goes out. The second one, which the color is only indi to indicate that it's the second one. Is that. And what happens is that this circle here moves over to the end and becomes a square. 
Uh, if you have any funness for the short circuiting theory, I think that should finish it. <coughs> All right, there are some other cases. passing through here at all, this one comes around. All right, a final, not, not quite a final, next to the final case, exposes the circle. I mean, the circle, that's inconsequential whether you use a circle or something else. These are just examples. Exposes a circle, and then a second circle here, Flash off, on off, flash on and off. But this time there's a barrier here all the time. Now, obviously, that's going to destroy the current motion. No, it isn't. What happens is that the circle comes here, jumps outside the barrier, and sets it back in here. Well, these in themselves seem to be pretty interesting and surprising results. <coughs> now, one more point here before I go on to discuss these. Uh, I said a little while ago that even uh, perceptual change wasn't quite a wide enough term because there's one more kind of case that obviously belongs with these others it doesn't involve change, but does involve bridging. You see, in the first cases, we had the same figure flashed on two occasions, separated spatially. Now suppose that we flash the figure with the square, it goes off, and then with a suitable time interval, we flash it on again. Well, there's bridging again. Ah, uh, what we get is a prolongation, you see. There's no change here. There's no change of shape or anything of the sort. There's no motion. It's just prolongation. So prolongation has to be added to change uh, in the general notion of perceptual bridging. Now what we have here is impressive and varied evidence of the persistence and ingenuity of the perceptual system in making a world according to its own lights. The bridging accomplished is often elaborate and intricate. And the course it takes has different characteristics in different sorts of cases. There seems to be no simple theory that embraces them all. Kohler's details the reasons some of them obvious from the cases I've given, why the several theories that have been proposed fail. For example, explanations in terms of eye motion are defeated by cases where several directions are involved, as well as by other evidence. I'll show you some of those cases, uh, but are there are cases where you flash a uh, circle here, and your next exposure is two circles here and here, and you get this dividing, you get transition to both, both of these, uh, hardly uh, compatible with eye motion, an explanation in terms of eye motion.
The short circuit theory, Kohler's writes, has been refuted more times than any other in perceptual psychology. Yet it must capture a quality that many investigators find attractive, for it has lingered on, close quotes. Uh, it seems to me surely there's enough evidence here in these different kinds of cases to uh, cancel out any short-circuiting theory that it's just a, an electrical contact in the retina or in the brain. More generally, he concludes that no theory of illusory motion has yet been proposed that accommodates more than a few of these observations. Now, apart from the question of general theory, we saw that three interesting, more special questions were raised. First one, can one important scale of similarity among figures be derived from the shape changes accomplished in this phenomenon? We found the answer to that was negative. Second, are apparent motion perception and real motion perception substantially the same? Now the presumption in favor of this seems to be strong. And Gibson uh, said, well, it's too bad that the distinction between apparent and real motion never was drawn in the first place, because they're just the same things. We know that in other cases, the case of reading that I mentioned, we pick up a few of the cues and supplement them. It seems highly probable that our perception of real motion, where a spot actually does move across uh, the screen, works likewise. To that extent, real and apparent motion are alike. Nevertheless, Kohler's argues that they are substantially different in important ways. First, of course, that real motion perception is controlled by the actual path, as apparent motion perception is not. That is, if you have the spot moving actually across here in some deviant pattern, now you see it that way. You don't uh, see it uh, ordinarily as following the path that the apparent motion would take. But second, and this seems to me an impressive argument, in most cases, Detection of a difference between real and apparent motion, I'm sorry. Second, and in most cases, detection of a difference between real and apparent motion is not difficult. And finally, the, the impressive argument, it seems to me, crossed motion is perceived where you have real motion, but it seems never to be perceived in the case of apparent motion. The case he gives is this. Uh, the first uh, display is this, and the second one, not below it, but on the same is, oh no, it, it is below it in this case, is this. And you don't get this in apparent motion. What you get is this turning into this and this turning into that. And in the experiments that he has conducted with all sorts of things, he never gets paths of motion crossing, even in the most, in the cases where you'd think it most likely. But on the other hand, of course, if you had these things actually moving there, you would see the paths crossing. Another question, another one of the theoretical questions that was raised in the course of this that I mentioned, is the bridging in apparent motion a matter of retrospective reconstruction? Do we explain the fact that the path starts out in the right way and hits the right target, even though it doesn't know where the second one's going to be? Uh, do we explain this by saying, well, the whole thing is a put-up job in that it waits until it has both stimuli and then constructs the path and uh, projects them backwards? Kohler's argues against this. He says the construction is in real time. He says, he suggests that the direction and course of the bridging is by anticipation induced by practice. 
It seems that apparent motion perception is often not very clean until a subject has had a little experience with it. And uh, he was inclined to attribute it to that. He is skeptical of the retrospective reconstruction theory. I kind of like it myself. Uh, I'm not convinced by his argument, and he's recently told me that he's having some doubts, but of course the question isn't one that we need to uh, debate or conjecture about. It's one that can be settled by a conclusive experimental test. What we need to do, of course, is in the first exposure, have the first flash in the center of the screen and the second one at the right. Next time, have the second one at the left and just alternate these until the subjects get used to the situation and then see how good he is uh, on the next occasion, if there's one here, whether he comes here readily or not. Now these experiments, uh, he's preparing equipment to conduct these experiments now, so far as I know he hasn't uh, conducted them yet. I've reviewed this material, however, not merely for the sake of these theoretical questions, but because, as I have said, it provides abundant examples of how perception builds a world that goes beyond the stimuli provided. And it illustrates how, in this making, copious amplification and, or deletion and all sorts of deformation sometimes occur. The theoretical questions that I've just commented on are interesting puzzles about perception, but they're not the puzzle about perception referred to in the title of this lecture. During the investigations reported in this book, I often urged callers to look into another question that very much interested me. What happens when the two flashes are of different colors. In his book, Collis, Collis had not done any experiments on this, and in his book he referred only to the somewhat sketchy work of others on this question. Page 43, he says, quotes, Squires confirmed Wertheimer's finding that differences in color were resolved smoothly by the visual system, close quotes. But no one, apparently, had investigated the root of that resolution. This was a question that interested me for the following reason. If we could answer such questions as whether the change from one color, say a red, to another, say a green, passed through grays or through the spectral hues, we might have a new and experimental basis for confirming or reconceiving our conception of the order of colors. For we might take the path followed as a straight line, as the shortest distance, and from this reconstruct the color solid. We would have a definitive interpretation of at least one important sort of similarity among colors. You see, uh, in case some of you are not, the usual diagram of the color solid uh, showing something like that, a double pyramid with a somewhat slanting base, and around here, red, or around here are the, uh, the circumference, the equator, are the hues, pure hues. Here is uh, black and here is white. There is a decreasing um, saturation as you get into the center. So that if you went from red to uh, green, straight through here, you'd go through middle gray. It just the red would just get grayer and then finally greener and then not green. On the other hand, if you went from here to here around here, you'd go red, orange, yellow, and so forth. Uh, and of course you might go through other routes. Now, uh, this is a sort of standard model. Sometimes it's more spherical and so on. 
I think uh, it has the value of being standard. Uh, I'm not uh, satisfied that uh, it rests on anything more than some sort of uh, rough judgments and insights, but anyway, it, it certainly could stand some exper experimental testing. This seemed to be one way we might do it. If we flashed a red figure and then, let's say, a red square and then a green one in such a way that we knew that uh, there would be smooth motion of the figure, then if the color changed through gray, well, all right, then this path, which is the shortest path in this model, the delicate and complex apparatus for carrying out these crucial experiments until after his book was published. He then did carry them out, and with a collaborator, von Gronau, reported his results in two papers. And I'll give you the references again, since these are not... The first is in Science, 28th of February, 1975, volume 187, pages 757 to 759. I'll read that once more in case anybody wants it. Science, 28th of February, 1975, volume 187, pages 757 through 759. And then a longer paper in Vision Research, and this, I'm not sure whether it's been published yet or not. I have uh, a copy of the TypeScript. Uh, the paper was received by Vision Research November 11th, 1974. It may or may not have been published yet. The experiment consisted of having the two flashes of different color, sometimes contrasting even complementary colors like red and green, sometimes colors more nearly alike, such as a red and a pink. Sometimes the two spots or figures were of the same size and shape. At other times, for example, the first flash might be of a red square, while the second was of a green or a pink triangle. And in the latter case, of course, we know that not only the motion, but the uh, shape transformation was smooth. Now, what path do you think the color transformation follows in such cases? Through the solid, along a great circle, or in some other way? Just think about it for a few seconds. What would your guess be? Shorter so, distance. <laughs> <laughs> I like a priori statements. Well, I'm now delighted to inform you that whatever you think, assuming it seems at all sensible, is wrong. <laughs> Common sense surely tells us that in the light of our experiments with motion, shape, and size, there is at least I'm sorry, uh, at least some variation on one of these smooth paths would be followed. Well, that's the satisfying thing about common sense and philosophy, as I suggested last time. It's very reliable. It's almost always wrong. However, to solve your feelings, if you're wrong in this case, you're in the company of all the leading psychologists to whom I've put the question, company of callers in advance of the experiments, and in the company of the present lecturer. Flash a red square and then a green or a pink triangle, and we see, as we know, a single figure moving from one position to another and transforming smoothly in shape from a square to a triangle. But what of the color? The figure, while moving and transforming in shape smoothly, stays red to about the midpoint and then abruptly changes to green.
Now this seems to me one of the most spectacularly unexpected results in the history of modern psych experimental psychology. And this is the puzzle about perception referred to in my title. And incidentally, it of course refutes the only statement practically that Cole has made about color transition in the book, that so-and-so confirms so-and-so's result that the smooth transition. Now, how is it that the color transformation not only seems to operate in an entirely different way from transition in place, shape, and size, but stubbornly so, so that even when accompanied, and one would suppose influenced by smooth motion and shape and size transformation, the color change remains abrupt. To explain this difference, perhaps the first thought is that after all, color is not position or shape or size, so that the presumption that apparent color change should parallel change in any of these other respects is unfounded. But as it stands, this does not help very much. For so is shape different from size and from position, and yet in all these there is smooth transition. Any adequate explanation on the basis of the special characteristics of color would have to point to a specific difference and show its relevance. One such difference is worth noticing. I'm not pausing for a dramatic effect. Uh, There's a slight problem with reading my handwriting. One such difference is worth noticing. Apparent change in position, at least difference in position in the visual field, a difference in, in position in the visual field, transition between such differences, is smoothly affected at will by eye or bodily movement. And likewise, by advancing or retreating, and by moving uh, the angle of viewing, changing our relationship to an object. Smooth, smooth transition of size and shape are likewise affected. So this is a very familiar and controlled phenomenon. We get these smooth transitions just by moving our eye across the figure, and so on, that moves in the visual. Now there's no parallel thing for color, no mere bodily motion uh, results in color changes uh, bridging a difference between two colors. Now certainly this is a relevant difference, but by itself it comes a long way from explaining why, when there is no eye motion or bodily movement, smooth transition occurs in place, shape, and size, but not in color. The bridging observed in the experiments reported in Kohler's book is a process of organization, of reduction of variety and complexity. The two flashes by motion bridging, and I'm talking about the book now, not about the color, become one by the addition of intervening material, and so on. Identity is established between the two disparate events. The perceptual system strives ingeniously and persistently to reduce multiplicity, to increase coherence and connexity. It goes to great length to achieve certain constancies. The constancies in most of these experiments are not object constancies as such, but rather constancies in continuity of figure, which enter in other circumstances into, or which may enter into object constancy. The organizational drives 
the organizational drive makes of what we see a much less buzzing, blooming confusion. It brings elements together and gives us in place of uh, sequences of disparate and uncoordinated events, it gives us processing upon enduring entities. But this is no a priori reason why such unity and coherence could not be achieved in any of many different ways. If we put together as one continuing entity a figure that changes abruptly in color in midstream, well, why couldn't we likewise put together two flashes that differ in place without having to bridge between them? Why do we have to bridge in the one case, not in the other? Or to put it the other way around, if we have to fill in the gap in the case of place and shape, why don't we have to do it in the case of color? Part of the answer lies in the difference already noted between color and the other features. Abrupt changes in the apparent place or size or color of an object are rather uncommon. These aspects of the appearance of a constant object commonly change smoothly as the position of our, our eyes in relation to the object changes. The paths of such change are so well worn that even where the paths are occluded, the missing parts are almost automatically supplied. Furthermore, an, an object is normally intentionally, uh, internally connected, not composed of two or more separate parts, either separated parts, either in space or time. And where there are parts blocked from observation, we likewise fill in to regain continuity and unity. On the other hand, color contrasts are entirely compatible with object unity. Most familiar objects, from people to houses to neckties, have contrasting colors with sharp boundaries between them. We feel no need to supply between the red and the black squares of a chessboard intervening patches of color that grade from one color to the other in order to consider this object one object. That's the answer to our question, is partly, that vision bridges in the case of place, shape, and size differences because such bridging is required for identity of objects or pseudo-objects, which I mean these figures, but need not and does not bridge color differences because they do not destroy such unity. All told, this makes up a very plausible explanation, but there are some disquieting considerations. In the first place, while sharp apparent color changes are not unfamiliar, as with sudden changes of illumination, lighting, sw switching, uh, switching on uh, lights, room or stage lights, still gradual transitions, even in color, are pretty common as light fades and changes slightly. Furthermore, while contrasting colors with sharp boundaries are indeed incorporated within many objects, still it is in terms of color contrasts against the background that the figures and the objects gain, uh, have unity. Kohler's figures consist of lines contrasting in color with the background. And so I can't rest quite content with a profit explanation. I don't think it's by any means the whole story. Sorry that was so haltingly read. I mean, the point is that uh, despite the fact that there are indeed familiar cases of color contrast within objects, still 
smooth transitions of color are pretty common. And furthermore, it is some kind of contrast between the outlines or the object and the background of some sort or other that gives us the cue according to which we organize these figures as figures or objects against the background. So I think that explanation, which I said sounded pretty plausible, misses the main point. The result of the experiments was, as I said, unexpected. And the search for an explanation was difficult and desperate. And what this proves is that Kohler's and I and all the others we talked to about this matter were incredibly stupid. Every time I say that, Kohler's winces and says he wishes I'd use some other word. <laughs> For the results should have been fully expected. Abundant evidence was there all the time and was obscured only by our common sense that was diluted by a false analogy. For every clean case of apparent motion or change in shape or size, even of monochromatic figures, has involved and depended upon abrupt color change. The apparent motion or change of a black figure against a white ground consists of abrupt change from black to white at every stage. Change is accomplished only so, and only so is a figure preserved during the change. We have a figure, and it moves over here. What does this motion mean uh, with preservation of the square? Well, it means that this, let's say it's white and black, uh, that this black here suddenly becomes white, this white becomes black, etc. There are these abrupt changes all along, and if there weren't, we wouldn't have gotten the simplest cases of apparent motion uh, for the monochromatic case, only uh, we were too dumb to see it. Abrupt color change thus ought to be more familiar to us than smooth motion or cha uh, smooth motion or change of shape or size. Our false expectations, which were extreme, were magnificently unjustified. So the puzzle about perception that gave the title to this lecture evaporates. But the fascinating facts of apparent change remain. The puzzle, while its history seems to me engaging and humiliating, was not the main reason for this discussion. Of primary concern for our purposes are the phenomena of perception. Notice in retrospect that there have been, that these have been investigated, experimented upon, debated as objectively as facts of physics. And that the difference between what is and what is not a fact in perception is as sharp as the difference between what is and is not a fact in physics. The task of determining the facts does not become arbitrary or pointless in the former case merely because there are so-called facts, these, these are so-called facts of apparent rather than of real motion. Indeed, the terms apparent motion and real motion tend to be as prejudiced as any racial epithet. And we might better use the terms perceptual and physical. Perceptual and physical facts are facts of different kinds or belonging to different worlds. What we have surveyed today is something of the elaborate ways perception makes its facts. This, as I have said, provides us with some striking examples of the general topic of my next lecture, the fabrication of facts. Thank you.
Thank you. If you give me a second to get a drink, you can tell them that we'll answer questions in a minute. That's labor. Professor Godman has kindly agreed to answer uh, a few questions. Uh, please. Can we wait just one second till it quiets down because I want everybody to hear your question. Like a figure of what? Yes. Yeah. 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 There, there are some experiments of that sort in the book, yes. I mean, and uh, there are also experiments with uh, meaningful things, I mean, letters and words and things like that. And uh, the results seem to be more or less the same. For the detailed results, I'm sure. Do all people see the same? Uh, no. No, the results reported are those of uh, the usual reaction, I mean a statistical thing, and there are deviations, and I'll have something to say about those deviations next time. I was going to say, if a person sees a particular type of transition, let's say like the example you showed there where the circle jumps over the barrier, yeah. and then you flash, let's say, uh, another picture where the circle goes through the barrier. You mean an actual, it actually goes through the barrier. In other words, yeah, in other words let's see if you flash alternately, one case where you did the apparent motion, one case where you did real motion, but, yeah. but a thicker path where the person tend to see the... Yeah. Uh, this hasn't been thoroughly investigated. It's an interesting question, not only in that case, but in other cases, how much you could influence what the person sees by habituation. Yeah. Uh, there's been a little of it done, but there's a lot more to be done. Yes. You made this distinction between an abrupt and smooth transition with respect to uh, figure and size on one hand and color on the other. Uh, would this have any, what relation does this have to time? Well, uh, the, the time enters in uh, in all cases because the two flashes are always uh, at different times and the process itself occupies time. And there can be abrupt difference in position, this and this, there can be abrupt difference in shape, there can be abrupt difference in size, tiny and big, there can be all these three together, or it can be color and so on. The abrupt difference is time-wise, more smooth, well, I don't know how you could reverse this thing very well. I mean, uh, it would be hard. Um, I wonder what is perceived if there is physically uh, a smooth transition uh, of colors. And I'm wondering if the perceived, the, the uh, smooth transition of colors could be learned through experience with the physical smooth transition of colors. It's an interesting question again. I don't know. I mean, certainly if. If you uh, present smooth, an actual smooth transition, uh, at least with a sufficient time, whatever that might be, you'll see it, just as you'll see a real motion that deviates from the apparent, ordinary apparent path. Uh, but again, what you can do, I and mean, that relates to this man's question here, I mean, what you could do by changing what's seen by uh, habituation, I don't know. And my, general feeling is you can do a great deal because my feeling is that, that a lot of what we see, think, and everything else is just a matter of habit. And uh, if you change the background experience, you're going to change the result. I think another possible kind of experiment that your suggests that wouldn't concern visual perception at all. There is some uh, brief discussion in the book here of uh, comparable experiments in other sense modalities, but I can't report to you what it is. I mean, I, I don't have it in my mind at the moment. What, but it's very, it's very brief, as I mean, But there is some brief discussion of what happens in such cases. It, it seems to me there's an obvious possible similarity to the color situation. Yes, yes. 
you'd have instead of motion, you'd have other other features. But uh, there's certainly no reason to suppose that some comparable uh, phenomenon wouldn't develop, because we've got, in view of what's I've reported here, we've got to be skeptical about uh, things for which there's no reason to suppose otherwise, because uh, we had no <laughs> But still, I mean, the point is perfectly well taken. And, uh, I think just the merest beginnings of experimentation on it have been undertaken. I don't think we can take too much Professor Goodman's time, well, but let's, let's have, no, a, few we can have a few more questions, please. Yes. Yeah. Now, of course, such uh, such observations are uh, relevant but unreliable in view of the fact that uh, these phenomena of apparent motion that are reported on here uh, don't appear. I mean, I couldn't do this for you now. With I mean, why not? Why don't I set up a screen and flash a light here and there? Because uh, the control of the times, distances, and everything else has to be so fine to get to get experimentally valid results, uh, that that couldn't be done. And so, to show uh, whether or not some kind of pitch transition occurs here, you'd have to experiment with much more delicate equipment than just a few speakers. Uh, there are two gentlemen here. Let's take them in order. Mr. Lee. If you had the, the two figures, both with two colors, and um, the colors shifted, um, do you know whether the, the figure would seem to move or whether the colors would seem abrupt? It would seem that this would be a test for which is... Well, now let's see what the case is. You mean if you had... Uh, you mean if you had... Is this one, one of your figures like that? Yeah. Yeah, and then, then what? Then you have another one over here with reversed? Yeah. Well, I think pretty clearly what would happen in this case, again, so it was risky that yes, what would happen in this case is that this would have changed abruptly to that and this would change abruptly to that. Uh, the question of what arising from perception, of course, has a very... The question of what arising from perception? Yeah, and because yeah, but because here we have uh, here we don't have a moving stimulus, you see, for detection. We have two static well, ones. I think we have a, I think eye might play, play a role. No, I'm afraid that the eye movements don't. Uh, I'm afraid that's pretty well discredited by by the data, especially in this case. Remember this case of the see there are a lot of cases here that I've left out. But I mean, when you got when you got a case like this, show this. Then you show this, and it's all very small, very short term. And then this sort of splits and goes in both directions. It's pretty hard to explain in terms of what I mean. I don't. I would expect that that uh, position would be strongly defended by many people. I think the evidence here is uh, considerable. Uh, I mean, a, a good deal of explanation would have to be done. There are also uh, some. I think there have been cases where the uh, the eye mov movements have been actually monitored too. But I can't swear to that during this. Well, Fred, we would really need Professor Rawls to decide who um, who will have the last questions. But please. 
Pardon? The data for these kind of experiments is subjective report, is that correct? There's, it seems to me that if there's a difference in category labeling of color as opposed to size or shape, or mm -hmm. then you might expect a, a difference in uh, the labeling of what you what you mean. Yes, well, the, the way the experiment is set up uh, tries to compensate for this as much as possible. I mean, not just giving sort of vague descriptions of what you see, but matching and so forth. So, and of course, uh, even so, uh, the uh, difference, the subjective difference in labels among English speaking people uh, is not likely to range between red and white, for instance. I mean, these, these are drastic differences that we're talking about. Let's take two more questions. Uh, this isn't uh, so much a question, but a comment. That okay. Is, uh, uh, what is uh, so fascinating about the uh, stroboscopic versus real movement uh, distinction is uh, this illusion of continuous motion. But the assumption that we make is that the visual system has an underlying continuum that corresponds to the continuum of the physical movement. But suppose this assumption was false. Let's say that the visual system broke up continuous stimulation into discrete pieces, discrete, either spatial or temporal. Then it would be the continuous motion that was an illusion. And no. the stroboscopic motion that was really the adequate stimulus to the visual system. And when looked at in this way, there's really no puzzle. That is, it's like, it's a little bit like Zeno's paradox. That is, it has something to do with the discreteness versus the continuity of the visual system. And therefore, the key for understanding perception of motion from a stroboscopic stimulation comes about from understanding the neurophysiology of the discreteness of the visual system? Well, uh, you see, I think I said some things related to this. In the first place, this relates to the question I discussed about uh, the um, relation between uh, apparent motion perception and real motion perception. Because it may be real motion perception is of this sort. I mean, just, just taking discrete clues and building up. But then uh, Kohler's uh, at least shows some differences between and real motion perception and apparent motion perception and the way it occurs. Uh, but uh, I, w I personally uh, would be disinclined to uh, call one or the other of any of these uh, well, uh, of these fairly uniform and uh, investigatable phenomena, call one of them illusion and the other real. I mean, I think it's, I think, it's, I think real is an emotive term, I mean. One, one more question, I think it's gentleman. Yeah. Was there any uh, difference in the apparent motion if you flash, let's say, in between the two intervals, if you flash a different figure? In other words, between, uh, at the time when this apparent uh, motion was occurring, yeah. could you affect it by outside stimulus? Well, uh, I think the answer to that is, I mean, I, I don't have everything in this book memorized. So, I mean, I've, these reports on things that I haven't written down. But I think what would happen is that the effect would be very much like this. I mean, here we had a case with a barrier, a permanent barrier. And I think if you manage to place the barrier just to pretend that this motion is here, that the thing would probably come out. Uh, but I mean, I'm not sure what Cola says about that. Thank you very much.